Um, what I'd like to do on this video is give you a demonstration of a full working air brake system. Uh, it would be a truck or a school bus or a tractor and include the trailer system. This display we have here is a full working air brake system. Uh, the only thing that's uh, mocked up on it would be the compressor. We're using shop air. Everything else on the system works exactly as it would on a truck or a tractor. To uh, get an idea of what we've got in front of us here, you take a look at this and it kind of looks like colored spaghetti. But if we take our system separately, you'll see that it's really pretty simple. I will break this down into six separate systems. We'll start off with our supply system, which includes the governor, the unloaders, and the, comp and the uh, compressor. Then we'll move on to the front axle system, rear axle system, the park control system. That would take into account our trucks and our school buses. If we add our trailer charge system, we will turn the vehicle into a tractor. And then, of course, finally, the trailer system uh, in and of itself it's, is independent of the uh, rest of the system. The first thing I'd like to mention, is, uh, there's a mistake that's in the industry today. When you say 121, you think of um, anti-lock or computer brakes. That was written out of the law back in the 70s, so most people think, well, that 121 is no longer with us. This, however, is a 121 system, and any vehicle that you've worked on that was built in the United States since 1975 is a 121 system. You can have a 121 system and not have anti-lock. 121 took a lot of different things into consideration. The main thrust of 121, which is still with us today, is the fact that we have a dual circuit system. We have a separate front axle system and a separate rear axle system. And on your dash, you would find either one gauge with two needles or two separate gauges. You will monitor your front axle pressure and your rear axle pressure. So this is your typical 1975 on up 121 system. Okay, to start off with our supply system, we'll start off with our compressor. Compressor is the heart of the system, but we can break it down into three separate sections. Describe the compressor in three separate sections. First we have the head, then the block, and the crankcase. The crankcase, obviously we have our crankshaft, in the block we have our piston, and in the head we have our discharge valve. This charge valve is very important. That's what gives us our compressed air. On the downstroke, air is drawn into the intake of the compressor from outside. And on the upstroke, that air is compressed. When it reaches a certain temp uh, pressure setting, the spring-loaded discharge valve will move up off its seat. And that compressed charged air will leave the compressor and enter the system. The air that enters the system will be very hot and will be slightly oily. Here's our discharge line. If you ever have any questions on how hot it gets, you never put your hand on this copper wire braid hose. You can get temperatures of 250, 300, 350 degrees. Oil gets into this line. If it heats up to 400 degrees, you've got uh, carbon. That's where we get our carbon from. The compressor kind of consider it as a uh, a small engine, it needs clean air, it needs to be cooled, and it also needs um, lubrication. On the clean air side of it, we have our intake right here, and very important, the compressor has to receive clean air. If it gets dirty air, it will end up as an all-passing compressor in a very short amount of time. It will ruin the cylinder walls, and the oil will come up past the rings and into the system. A compressor gets its air um, actually consider four different ways. It may have its own strainer, which you'd find on the side of the compressor, the round paper type or the square sponge type. We call that our uh, naturally aspirated. And there is two other setups that uh, I can describe for you on the uh, easel. We can have our air cleaner or our turbocharged compressor. 
is our engine air cleaner. This here would be our turbo. Here's our compressor and our intake. The turbo draws air from the air cleaner. We'll call this the negative side of the turbo. And then sends that air on into the engine manifold or the positive side. If you have a compressor with an inlet line that is hooked into here, that would be considered an air cleaner style compressor. If it is hooked in this side of the turbo, the positive side, that's a turbocharged compressor. When you change your engine air cleaner, if you have the engine air cleaner style, you've changed the um, filter on the, on the compressor. You have to make sure that this line doesn't break or become loose or cracked in any ways because then you will bypass the filter and draw dirty air into the compressor. Turbocharged is a good setup because you are sending uh, pressurized air up, say, perhaps 28 PSI into the compressor, which will help keep oil down in the crankcase of the compressor. The compressor has to be cool because that head will get uh, pretty hot from that compressed air. There's three different ways we do that. Actually, there's two ways, but three different uh, designs. There is a, a straight water-cooled compressor, which is this style right here. There is a completely air-cooled compressor, and then there's a combination of the two, which would be this style right here, where you have a water-cooled head and an air-cooled block. Now, the only thing really to to remember about the water lines, the maximum cooling would, to have, would be to have the water running through the bottom one side and out the top the other side. Heat rises, so that's how we'll get our maximum cooling. If you've got a carbon buildup in the discharge line or a carbon buildup in the discharge valves, you might have a problem with uh, overheating. One discharge valve that's plugged in the open position, you're running on one cylinder, the symptom would be slow buildup. And then finally, the lubrication of the compressor is very important. The oil, you have to give it nice clean oil, it has to get in there and it has to get out fast. The oil will usually enter through the base here or through the base in the compressor here. And then it will from that point enter through the crankshaft makes its way to the rod bearings, splashes up against the cylinder wall, and then returns through the base of the compressor. On a flange design, or a, a direct engine drive system, the oil return is usually at the base of the flange. Very important, when we use our gaskets here, and we use our gasket material, we have to be careful because there is an oil return line here. That will be plugged with gasket material and the symptom will be an oil passing compressor, the wet tank will fill up with oil, they'll go back for warranty. They reject the warranty when they find the Permatex or whatever type of sealant, sealant you use in this oil return. So be careful we don't use too much of sealant on the flange. If you take care of the quality of the air that goes into the compressor, you will get good long life out of the compressor. You obviously have to give it clean oil. That'll come from the engine. And we're going to cool it properly. You have to maintain the filtration. If you've got the strainer style, they would possibly need to be changed quite a bit more often than your air cleaner engine style or the style that's uh, connected to the turbo. The next component of the uh, supply system is our governor located right here. The governor controls the air pressure in the system. The governor monitors the pressure through this line right here that runs back to our first tank, our supply tank, or sometimes called our wet tank. When this pressure reads about 120, the piston, spring-loaded piston in the, in the governor moves up off its seat and allows air pressure to pass through, through the governor into the unloaders, which are located right here. What we have on the unloaders are two stems, a paddle, and a spring. When that reaches 120 pounds of pressure, we don't need any more um, air pressure back in the system. 
The unloaders move up off their seat when they receive pressure from the governor, and we have, in fact, set up an orifice between the two cylinders. So rather than send pressure back into the system, we are really just tossing the air between the two cylinders. This is called our unloaded mode. We are no longer sending pressure back into the system. The engine's still running, the pistons on that compressor are still going up and down. When we uh, make a few stops or through normal leakage, we get down to 100 pounds or so. We drop about 20 pounds. The spring pressure in the governor moves back, forces the piston back down, takes that pressure off of the unloaders and exhausts it out the top port or the exhaust port of the governor. Now that port is threaded, so you could put a hose in there to re remote mount your exhaust. You don't put a plug in there. I've seen plenty of plugs. You don't put a plug in the exhaust of your governor. The unloaders move back down. We now have lost our orifice between the two cylinders. We are back to compressing air through the discharge valves in the head back into the system until we build up to 120. And at 120, we go back into our unloading mode. To give you an idea how the unloaders work, Right now we're running at about 120 pounds of system pressure, so we are, in essence, in the unloaded mode. We're no longer sending pressure back through the system. This right here is a gauge that is telling us we have about 110 pounds of pressure on our unloader, so our unloaders are up. We make a few stops, we drop our pressure down. Watching this gauge, we went our 20 PSI, we drop our unloader pressure to zero. The pressure now is building back in the system. We watch this gauge, our unloaders are down. We get to about 120 pounds. We should begin to see the needle move up. And now we're back to our unloaded mode. Our uh, unloaders are back up again, and we're back in the unloaded mode. The governor pressure can be adjusted. We can take the cap off. With air pressure on the governor, we can loosen that nut put a screwdriver on the end of that screw and turn that counterclockwise. Counterclockwise will increase your pressure setting. If you're at 120 and you want to go to 130, you turn it counterclockwise, you can move the high side of that pressure up to 130. However, that 20 PSI differential will never change. So if you're up to 130, your cutout will be at 110 rather than at 100. Should make the point that we never take that snap ring out of there when there's air pressure on here, because this turns into a 22 shell. It can be very dangerous. Okay, if we send our charged heated air into our system, we'd move on to our wet tank. What we'd like to put in between the compressor and our wet tank or our supply tank is a system that will dry and clean the air out before it gets into the rest of the system to contaminate it. The best system in the marketplace right today is a true desiccant style air dryer. This right here is a Bendix AD2, which is a desiccant style air dryer. And right here we've got a model of it. Very simple in operation. Air enters from the compressor here, goes down the side of the cartridge, and up through this blue oil filter in the bottom. Some of the oil that's in the air will be trapped in that oil filter. Then it'll move up into this area here. This is a desiccant. It's a special chemical that can whisk water away from the air. Here we have oil, here we have water, and up through a single check valve into an empty tank, we have nice, dry, clean air. Out through another single check into our supply tank. So we leave the contamination behind in our air dryer. We've got our air through the system. We've got our water in our canister here. And we've got our oil down here. We're going to have to find a way to flush that out. And it's very simple, and it's done with the use of the governor. There is a line located on the purge port of the dryer that goes up here to our governor our governor unloader port. Now, when the system is operating properly and we get to our point where we're going to unload the compressor through the governor, air pressure that go, went to our unloaders will also go down our unloader port to the end cover of our air dryer. 
It will open up the air dryer. Now we have 120 pounds of dry, clean air above the cartridge. We have two holes drilled in the top of the cartridge. And as soon as this is opened by the pressure from the governor, this compressed air is allowed to release itself into atmosphere. It has to go through the cartridge to do it. And in so doing that, it will flush out the oil and the water from the air dryer, cleaning it out, ready for its next pass of air. So right now, we're at a little bit under 120 pounds. We've got 120 pounds of unloader pressure. So I'll dump our system down. Okay, now we're back to loading the system. We're actually sending air through our air dryer. Our, we're up at about 110. When we get to about 120, our governor cutout will get a purge at the dryer. And there it is. And that'll happen during the day. When you hear that, you'll know that the, uh, the system's working properly and your compressor is just unloaded. This system right now, this purge is wide open. No air can travel into the system. We have to keep in mind it's controlled by the governor. Many of the problems that may come up with an air dryer are not the air dryer whatsoever. They are actually the governor. So possibly you can change a governor and not have to change an air dryer. Eventually our air dryer will be filled with uh, water and oil. The oil contamination will sooner or later bypass our oil filter and end up coating our desiccant. At that point, the desiccant will lose its ability to dry and clean the air. We will then have to remove our desiccant. On the case of the AD2, we take our end cover off, we take our wrench, and we draw the desiccant down. The desiccant has core value. You take it back to your local Bendix distributor. You purchase another one, you put it back up into the canister. Do not use an impact wrench to put it back in. You can damage the plate at the top. How often should you change the cartridge on the AD2? You should change it every two years or 200,000 miles, whichever comes first. Okay, this you see right here is a Bendix AD4 air dryer. It works exactly as the AD2 does. The difference in it is that it's a little shorter, a little fatter. It's got a little bit larger oil filter and a bit more desiccant in it. Also, all of the porting on the AD4 is in the end cover. The desiccant change in here is a little bit different. We take our end cover off and we take our shell off. This right here is our cartridge. There are four Allen screws here that hold this plate to the cartridge. We take the plate off, we take our cartridge back in as a core, get another Bendix remanufactured cartridge, tighten it back onto the plate, put it back in the shell and put the end cover back on. Again, we're ready to go. The AD4 should be changed every three years or 300,000 miles depending on the type of service. There is a ceiling ring right here between the plate and the air dryer. You'll get that in the kit. You'll also get a little tube of pneumatic grease. We don't want to grease that particular seal. If that seal cracks or breaks in any way, air will move up through the plate, bypass the cartridge, come out the seal, and end up in the system, and we won't have an air dryer. We also have a uh, heater element in the end cover of both the AD2 and the AD4, and it's located right here. This will be hooked into the on portion of your engine. Now overnight, your engine's off, and it'll freeze up. Some of the water will get in the end cover and freeze up. You turn the engine on in the morning, the heater will turn on, because when that end cover gets to about 40 degrees, thermostatically controlled, the heater will turn on, melt the ice down, and the air pressure will blow it out. When the end cover reaches a uh, temperature of about 80, 85 degrees, it will shut off again. If there's a problem with the heater not working, uh, it could be something as obvious as a broken wire. That'd be the first thing to check. 
If that's not the case, you could possibly have a bad thermostat. You can get a thermostat kit and just replace the thermostat. That'll solve the problem. If that doesn't, it's possibly a bad heater element. Uh, in that case, you'd have to get another end cover because the heater element is built into the end cover itself. You can take the end cover, it has core value, get a remanufactured Bendix end cover, put it back on, you're back in business again. Okay, as we moved our hot, oily, dirty air through our dryer, now we have our nice clean air going into our first tank downstream of the system, known as sometimes it's the west, wet tank or possibly our supply tank. We'd like to call it the, the supply tank now. This valve right here is a very important valve in the system. This is our safety valve. It works in conjunction with our governor. If our governor decides not to unload the system and build that pressure from 120 to 130 to 140 to 150, this valve right here will pop off and release that pressure. If this valve here is bad and the governor is bad, that's all you've got. Uh, you possibly blow a head gasket in the compressor, but you've got a possible dangerous situation because the pressure may go well above 150 pounds. The two single check valves feed both the front and the rear axle systems. They allow air to travel into the front and rear axle systems, but not back again. So in essence, what they do is they protect the front and rear axle service systems from a bad supply system. Now, an easy check of those two single check valves would be to drain down your supply tank and see if the gauges in your dash move. You can see here the gauge doesn't move, telling us that our check valves are operating properly. If the gauge does move down, the truck's illegal, you just change the single check and you're back in business again. Now we're going to move into our front axle system. And that's in red on the board here. Supply tank feeds a single check, which feeds our front service reservoir. It sends supply pressure down to our foot valve. A very important valve in the system. And this is what changes or what makes a difference between the 121 system and the pre-121 or the pre-1975 system. This is a dual circuit valve. It looks like the old single circuit valves, but it's completely different. This is actually two valves in one. The cir circuit closest to the pedal is the primary circuit. And that, in most cases, operates our rear axle brakes. The circuit furthest from the pedal is the secondary circuit, and that would operate our front axle brakes. We have 120 pounds of pressure waiting here the driver forces his foot down on the pedal, and that pressure is sent out our delivery lines through usually a quick release valve, which is located here, on down to our chambers. The quick release valve does not speed up the application of the brake. It'll speed up the release of the brake. It doesn't have a supply source, but it does have an exhaust port. To review the front axle system, we have our front axle tank. We have our dual circuit brake valve. We have our quick release. And we have our two chambers. Now we're getting our feed of air from our supply through our single check valve. And that front pressure enters our secondary circuit furthest from the pedal of our foot valve, and when the driver activates the pedal, that pressure there enters the quick release valve. From the quick release valve, it enters the front axle chambers, applying the front brakes. When the brakes are released, driver's foot is off the pedal, chamber air is exhausted from the quick release valve, and service or signal air is exhausted from the foot valve. As many of you know, there has been a change to the law. Um, in the past, there were certain cases where you didn't have to run with front brakes. Now, any vehicle that's been built since July of 1980 has to have front brakes. 
There is a device that can be put in the system that is legal. It's called a uh, LQ4 limiter or a uh, ratio valve. And it is this valve right here. It is piped in between our foot valve and in this case our quick release valve. Now the best way to describe this is actually to demonstrate it. At a typical stop of maybe 20 or 30 pounds at a stop sign or a uh, yield sign, I apply 30 pounds of pressure to the limiter and this gauge will tell us how much pressure is going into the front axle chambers. I've got 30 delivered from the foot valve and as you can see I've only got half of that on the front chamber. So that limits our front axle pressure 50 percent. Now you've got a panic stop where somebody runs out in front of the truck. So you put your foot in it and you give it well more than 60 pounds but I'm going to apply 60. As you can see on an emergency stop, when we applied 60 pounds of pressure, the valve delivered full pressure of the 60 pounds to the front axle. So between 0 and 40 pounds, it will deliver half of that. Between 40 and 60, it will begin to blend in. And then at 60 pounds on up, you'll deliver full pressure to the front axle. So on your typical service stops, you're limiting front axle pressure 50%. Then on a panic stop, emergency stop, you will automatically give your front axle full system pressure. This valve also is a quick release valve. There is an exhaust port at the bottom. It can work in conjunction with a quick release or it can work as a, as a quick release and the quick release valve can be eliminated. Our rear axle system, our same supply tank through our single check valve supplies our rear axle tank and that sends rear axle service pressure to our primary circuit of our foot valve, the one closest to the pedal. When the driver forces his foot down, he sends pressure through this green line here, we call that signal pressure, back here to our relay valve on our rear axle. Now the relay valve is a quick release valve in that it has an exhaust to get the brakes off fast, but it also has a supply line that runs back to our rear axle service tank. So there's 120 pounds of pressure right here waiting for signal pressure to come down through the service line from our foot pedal. And that pressure will force the piston down in the relay, closing the exhaust and allowing the supply air to pass through the valve, out the delivery ports, through the hose to the service chambers on the rear axle, applying the rear axle brakes. A quick review of the rear axle system. We have our rear axle tank supplied by our uh, supply tank. We have our dual foot valve. We have our relay valve. In this case, it happens to be an R12 valve. And we have our rear axle service chambers. Supply air that fills the rear axle tank and that air that's in the rear axle tank through our supply line enters the primary circuit of our foot valve. When the foot valve is actuated by the driver, delivery pressure or signal pressure enters our relay valve, forces a piston down and sends that pressure onto the service chambers applying the rear axle brakes. At this point I'd like to um, talk a little bit about the uh, slack adjusters. Another very important part of the system, our connection between our push rod and our foundation brakes. Uh, it's the very important link in the chain. This you see here is a Bendix ASA5 automatic slack adjuster. Before I get into that I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about um, standard slack adjusters and manual adjustment kind of a, a philosophy on brake adjustment would be to, to get the friction material as close to a cool drum without rubbing. The best way to do that is to lift the axle off the ground, spin the tire and bring that slack adjuster up until you get that tire to stop spinning. Then you bring it back just far enough so you get a 360 de degree turn of that tire without any rubbing. To a cool drum 
as close as you can get without rubbing. There's one other thing to think about when you do a, a manual slack adjustment. We've got a certain angle we have to worry about. Our chamber and our push rod, and here we've got our slack adjuster. We want to get a 90 degree angle at one half maximum stroke. Now when you put an, a, uh, another chamber on, you're going to get a push rod and it's going to be eight miles long and you're going to cut that down. People usually cut that the same length as the one they're taking off. Probably be a better idea to consider this angle. We want 90 degrees at one half maximum stroke. What's maximum stroke? That depends on the chamber itself. For instance, a type 30, maximum stroke is two and a half inches. Two and a half inches between here and when that push rod makes its full travel out. We want 90 degrees at an inch and a quarter. A smaller chamber, less stroke. A larger chamber, more stroke. On our uh, demonstra demonstrator here, we have an um, automatic slack adjuster. Automatic slack adjuster uh, takes that manual adjustment out and does it uh, automatically. Very simple device, really. As the push rod moves forward, this linkage here, this arm, tries to get longer. It can't get longer, but it moves up, and it turns, turns the worm gear, adjusting the brake. Now, when we get up to the drum itself, there's a clutch mechanism, a spring. There's a lot of torque now being applied. The spring slips, and no further adjustment is made. There's also 22 thousandths worth of play in the linkage itself, so it comes back a bit. In essence, it has made an adjustment, but is not close enough to a warm drum that will later contract, get smaller, and lock the brakes up. That problem has been eliminated from the automatic slack adjuster. One other thing in uh, kind of a comparison of a manual and automatic slack adjuster and how they operate, draw a little graph here. This would be uh, inches of stroke. Let's say two inches here, one inch here. This would be time. Now let's just use this for sake of argument. When that truck comes in, the stroke might be up here to two inches. Remember on a Type 30, you've only got a total of two and a half inches. So you do a brake adjustment, you may bring that stroke somewhere down into this area. Then as time goes by, that stroke will slowly increase until we get back up here to two inches again. You'll bring it back down, and as time goes by, it will get back up to two, so on and so forth. An automatic slack adjuster is consistent in that you will get this type of a line. You may not see an increase in lining wear if you were doing good manual adjustments. Uh, the fact of the matter is you won't have to get under there and adjust an automatic slack adjuster. It will do it on its own. It does have a grease fitting. We want to give that a shot of chassis lube every once in a while to uh, keep the salt and the dirt out of that slack and give it a little bit longer life on the vehicle. However, you should never have to adjust an automatic slack adjuster if it's doing its job properly. The next system we're going to discuss is the uh, park control system. And that consists of our yellow PP1 button. It sends air pressure through this center orange line down to usually a quick release valve. The air enters that quick release valve, enters our spring brake canister, and compresses our, in this case, our Type 30 spring. If you have any question about the power compressed air, 30 square inches of area and 90, approximately 90 pounds of pressure, and this spring will flatten. This is kind of like a coil spring on a pickup truck. This clamp right here can be a very dangerous thing, because if this clamp is removed, 
and the spring is not caged, it'll come out of there in a hurry and it could hurt someone or possibly even kill someone. If we do ever have to take this clamp off to change a diaphragm, we're certainly going to cage our spring mechanically. And then put a lot of trust in that bolt and uh, hopefully nothing will happen. Remember that when the air pressure is disengaged and the spring is forward, we have a spring this side that is in a canister about this size, so it's still very dangerous. Now what I'd like to do is go back to the easel and uh, review that system and show you a valve that is in the system that you can't see on the board because it's built into a module behind the board right now. Okay, our park control system, we have our PP1 valve, we have our quick release valve, and we have our spring brakes, and we also have our rear service tank and our front service tank. The front and rear service tank feed a double check valve. That double check valve will deliver the higher of these two pressures to the push-pull valve. When you force the button down, you send delivery pressure out the delivery port of the push-pull valve, filling the quick-release valve, closing the exhaust on the quick-release, sending that pressure to the spring brake, compressing our spring. When the button comes up, air is exhausted from our signal line, our supply line, and also exhausted from the quick release valves. The spring moves forward and we park the vehicle. All right, now I want to demonstrate a particular dangerous situation. I'm driving down the road at 55 miles an hour, and this drain cock here for whatever reason blows off and you lose your rear axle tank. That needle on the gauge on the dashboard goes down to zero. At 60 pounds on down, your buzzer will go on and your uh, red light, your low pressure indicator will go on. Notify the driver that he's got a problem. What will happen to the brakes on the vehicle uh, while you're running down the road? Um, either the brakes will go on or the brakes won't go on. Before I answer that question, we'll just uh, dump the tank and see what happens. This is the gauge that monitors our spring brakes, and as you can see, it's still well above 90 pounds. So we're still rolling down the road. Now, why didn't the spring brakes come on when we lost that tank? We have to go back to our easel. And here is the reason. A double check valve feeds the supply of the PP1. So if you lose one tank, this double check, the shuttle will move down and deliver the other tank. We don't want that spring brake to come on when we don't expect it because it's a pretty fast stop. But we still have a problem. We're driving down the road at 55 miles an hour. The buzzer's on. One of the gauges is at zero. The driver instinctively will put his foot on the foot pedal. Will he have rear axle brakes? Well, he won't have rear axle service brakes because we have a rear axle tank that's now empty. There's no way to activate that relay valve on the rear axle to apply the rear service brakes. This particular truck here does have rear axle brakes. I will make a brake application. We will watch this needle and watch that push rod. Well, two things happened. We had a rear axle brake and we also had a loud noise. The reason for the rear axle brake, we did lose our rear axle service pressure, however, we still had pressure in the spring, in the spring brake canister, and the spring moved forward. 
and I activated that with the foot pedal. Now this is a system that may or may not be on some of your vehicles. It's done with one very special valve, and it's this valve located right here. And that's an SR1 spring brake valve. And the main reason for that valve being on this system is to ensure a safe stop in case of a loss of a rear axle tank. It's really very simple how it operates. This green line that runs here enters our rear axle tank. That line in this port monitors rear axle pressure. When there is pressure here, this valve does absolutely nothing whatsoever. It just goes along for the ride. When you lose this pressure, you now activate this valve and you open up this port below it. This port with the red line, if you follow the red line back, You'll notice that enters the delivery port of the front axle circuit system where we still have pressure. When you force the pedal down, you send pressure out the delivery line, that red line, it enters the SR1, forces a piston in the center of the valve down which opens the exhaust port. What air is released from that exhaust port? Spring brake pressure. So we have a modulated release of our spring brakes. So in essence, we have a rear axle brake that can get us on the side of the road and time to call for the hook. If we don't have an SR1 on the vehicle, we could do this. and we'll come to a stop. However, using it in that sense, you are either on or off. There is no in-between. There is no gentle stop. The SR1 will provide us with the proper safe stop in case of loss of rear axle pressure. While we're on the subject of the uh, park control system, I want to bring up another subject that's involved with this, and that is brake compounding and brake anti-compounding. It's a situation that happens every day. Um, you pull up on the side of the road and you're on a hill and you park the truck. When you get back in the truck again, you notice there's a car that pulled up right behind you. So you get, you get the engine going, you build up your system pressure up to operating levels and you're ready to move. Are you going to push the yellow button in? No, because if you do that, you'll roll back into the car that's behind you. What you do is you put your foot on the foot pedal and then you push the yellow button in. When your foot is on the foot pedal and the yellow button is out and you're parked, you have actually made two brake applications. Now we move down to the end of the board here. We have no air in our spring brake canisters. Brake is on. We have no air in our service chambers. Brake is off. You force your foot down on the foot pedal, you activate your relay valve, you send pressure into your service chambers, you are now applying brake number two. Air here, brake on, no air in the spring, brake on. You have two brakes on, you've compounded your brakes. This can cause damage to the diaphragms, slack adjusters, push rod, camshafts, so on and so forth. You're over-torquing your foundation brakes. I'm going to attempt to do that here. I will make a brake application, and what we need to watch here would be both gauges and the push rod on the rear axle. Remember now, our yellow button is out. We make a brake application. Now what happened back here were both needles moved up at the same time and the push rod didn't move in or out. That was a demonstration of brake anti-compounding. Before I explain how it happened, let's just think of what actually did happen on the rear axle. When I forced the foot pedal down, I sent air pressure into the spring canister. You saw this needle move up. That compressed the spring. Air in here, the brake came off. At the same time, air pressure entered 
the service chamber via the relay valve. Air pressure in the service chamber, the brake is applied. So one brake came off, the other one went on. Release the foot pedal, exhaust the air. Air is released from the service chamber. Brake off, air is released from the spring brake chamber, brake on. So we never compounded the brakes, we never made two brake applications at once. And the push rod didn't move, so we didn't roll back into the car that was behind us. Now, I'm going to use the easel again to explain that by separating that from the system. OK, we're going to start off with our R12 relay valve. And what we got here is our service and our spring brake chambers. Right here is our quick release valve. Now as we know, we get pressure from our foot valve that activates our relay valve, and that sends pressure to the service chambers applying the brakes. We also get pressure from our yellow button. It enters our quick release and sends pressure into our spring brakes. This is a very simple idea, and it works well. What did we do in this case? We teed off of one of the delivery ports of the R12 relay valve, and that entered a special port in that quick release valve, which changes that to a QR1C, a special quick release valve. This here we would call our anti-compound port. When we were parked, there was no air in any of the chambers. We put our foot on the pedal. We activated our R12 valve. That sent air into the service chambers. At the same time, it sent air into the quick release and into the spring brake chamber. Brake on, brake off. Foot off the pedal. Air is exhausted from both sides. Brake off, brake on. And that would be our anti-compounding. It's a safety feature. It will also save you time and hassle in uh, changing damaged uh, foundation brake parts. A couple other things to mention. Uh, get involved a little bit with some troubleshooting and some possible problems. Uh, this would be a fairly common one. You've got an exhaust on that relay valve, and it's leaking air. So you take that relay valve off, you put another one on, and that one's leaking. Hopefully you didn't send the other one back as a core. You can put that back on the shelf because there's not a thing wrong with it whatsoever. Chances are you've got a leak between your spring brake and your service chamber. There is air pressure here, and there's a seal in between the two. And if that leaks, that will send air into an empty service chamber through an empty delivery line out an open exhaust port. And you can change as many of these as you like you won't solve the problem until you change the seal. That might be a fairly common problem. However, uh, it brings up an important point that can you, you can use in troubleshooting an air brake system to keep one thing in mind. When your system is full of pressure and nothing is activated, no one has their foot down on the foot pedal, you will have empty delivery lines and open exhaust ports. The delivery lines on the foot valve will be empty. The del delivery lines on the relay valves will be empty. And the exhaust ports will be open. Any back pressure traveling through an empty delivery line will come out an open exhaust port. It'll make this valve look like it's leaking when there's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. So we will have, when we're not activated, empty delivery lines and open exhaust ports. Another troubleshooting problem that would be a bit tougher to find, possibly, the driver claims that when he forces his yellow button in, he gets air exhausted from his foot valve. Now, you think, uh, how can that be possible? We have two separate systems. We do. We have our park control system. We have our uh, front and rear axle systems. Well, the situation in this case, you might have a bad SR1 valve. It may look like you've got a bad push-pull valve or a bad foot valve, but you don't. 
You possibly have changed the foot valve, you still have the leak. You've changed the push-pull valve, you still have the leak. What could be happening, when he forces the button in, he sends air pressure through the orange line, that has to enter that SR1 valve. If it's working properly, it'll go, go straight through and onto the spring brakes. If it is not, it may send pressure into the valve, out this port here, a red line, which is hooked back into the delivery port, piped into the delivery port of the foot valve. This is an empty delivery line, and it'll go back and right out an open exhaust port. That finishes the um, truck or school bus portion of the program. To turn this vehicle here now into a tractor, as far as the air brake system is concerned, we have to add one more particular system, and that is our red button, our PP7, or our trailer charge system. It works in conjunction with our yellow button, our park control system. Both tanks, through a double check, feed our PP7 button, force that button in, and air travels through this orange line here back to our tractor protection valve. When there is 55, 60 pounds of pressure in this portion of the tractor protection valve, the piston moves down and opens up this valve completely. Air then travels from the supply line here into the supply line feeding our trailer system. The service side of that trailer system, or, or the tractor trailer system, is in a double check valve that feeds the tractor protection. When the driver forces his foot down on the pedal, he sends delivery pressure out the delivery ports of the foot valve. The red and green lines head back here to a double check valve. That will deliver the higher of the two pressures through the tractor protection valve. Now we're going through our service section. Our supply section has already opened up the entire valve. Sends that pressure on down through the lines, through the green line here on the trailer to another R12 relay valve. And that applies our trailer brakes. Some tractors have a uh, optional hand valve or trolley valve, which is this valve located right here. This valve gets its supply air from the front axle tank. When you apply the trailer brake, you force the handle over, and that sends pressure out the delivery line of the trailer valve, or the trolley valve, through the red line here, back to our double check valve, through our open service tractor protection section, back here to our relay valve applying our rear axle brake. Release and then an application. Just the trailer service brake. So in essence, uh, it works as the foot valve on the tractor. However, it will only apply the trailer service brakes. It does not apply tractor service brakes. So a quick review of that uh, trailer charge system. We have our control port, which is our PP7. We have back here our tractor protection valve. And we have our reliable two service tanks, our rear and our front axle. Now, they will feed That same double check that they fed for the park control system. That would be the double check valve, and that will deliver the higher of those two pressures to the supply port of the PP7. Force the PP7 in, and that will send pressure out the delivery line, opening up our tractor protection valve. Opens this completely both sides and sends pressure onto the trailer system. The uh, 
service side of that tractor trailer system is controlled by our foot valve. Both primary and secondary air go down to the double check valve located here prior to the tractor protection valve. So our secondary air that was our front axle air, that pressure is delivered to this double check. Now we've also got our rear axle air which is going back there. That enters our double check. Providing the PP7 has been activated and it's sent pressure through the tractor protection, this is open. The higher of these two pressures is delivered into the tractor protection service section and that air, whatever it might be, is delivered on to the relay valve of the trailer. Okay, now a demonstration of how the tractor protection valve uh, and the PP7 work. We've got full system pressure, our buttons are in. You see those bumps in the road with those two black lines that go down and what has happened in that case is the bump was enough to knock off our supply, we used to call it our emergency line, now we call it our supply line. Okay, our air pressure bled down to approximately 80 pounds. In this case, our tractor protection valve closed off and didn't allow any more pressure to be lost from our tractor system. And our red button automatically popped out. Notifying the driver that he's been dragging his trailer a slight ways because if you look back here, our spring brakes on our trailer have applied. When that supply line is vented, the spring brakes on the trailer will apply. Now we'll hook this back up again. Okay, now we've got our system pressure back up again. We have our red button in. The opposite situation would be to lose the hose on the service side. As you can see, we're still running. This hose is off. We can apply either our trolley valve or our foot valve, and you'll notice we're going to lose air. You can hear that air draining out of the system, and it's draining both of the tanks down. Now what's happening, those two tanks that feed that foot valve, that feed this double check, are going out of opened tractor protection valve because there is pressure here. So this is open, and there was nothing in this case to prevent air loss here. Your spring brakes have not applied, however, you do not have trailer service brakes. Okay, working uh, with the same system on the park control end of it, our PP1 or yellow button, when we pull this button out, not only do we set up the spring brakes on the tractor, we also set up the spring brakes on the trailer. That's because the yellow button is venting the pressure in our orange line. As we move down our orange line, our trailer charge line, loss of pressure in this section closes off that tractor protection valve. Closes that, sets up the spring brakes on the entire system, the trailer and the tractor. We push our buttons back in again. We decide we're going to park just the trailer. We can pull our red button out. That parked the trailer only. That's why there is a little note on our red button that says not for parking. When the red button's out and the yellow button's in, your trailer is parked, however, your tractor is not. On the two button system that we have here, this is an MV2 module, we can park the tractor and release the trailer without the third button. All we have to do in this case, pull the yellow button out, parking the tractor, push our red button back in, and that releases the trailer. 
So with this MV2 module, we have the ability of the three button system in the two button module. The last system I'd like to discuss on the tractor is the brake proportioning system. It's actually part of the uh, service system. It's an option and it's used for safety reasons. Um, we've got to think of it as uh, driving that tractor without a trailer behind it or bobtailing. In the bobtail mode, the first thing we do, we're going to pull our red button out. And we're going to go back to our tractor, our trailer rather, and we disconnect our lines. Now it's really not that easy when you get back in that tractor and just drive because you've got a rear axle brake system that is designed to stop part of that fully loaded trailer. Now when you're traveling on that slippery road or that wet road and you've got that overkill on that rear axle of that tractor, you just touch those brakes and that tractor is going to try to turn around on you. And that what brings this next portion in, which is our brake proportioning system. The rear axle portion of that consists of this valve right here, our BP1 rear, and this valve right here, which is a TR3 inversion valve. The TR3 inversion valve gets its what we call control air through this orange line. Now, if you follow that orange line back, that is the trailer charge supply line. When the red button was in, there was air pressure along this orange line. That air pressure entered this TR3 and it shut off, or exhausted I should say, any air pressure that would be in the valve that would travel out its delivery port. So there was no pressure in the delivery port. No pressure in this black line. This valve here does absolutely nothing. This valve, by the way, is cut in between this line that goes back to our foot valve and this line that goes to our relay valve. In this case, it receives 30 pounds of pressure. It delivers 30 pounds of pressure. Now, when you pull the red button out and you've lost that air pressure in the orange line, that's noted by the control port of the TR3. The, control, the TR3 then takes the supply pressure from this tank through this line here and delivers it out the black line. It enters the PP1, the BP1 rear axle, activating it. What happens there best to do is to uh, actually make the application. Okay, our yellow button is in. I will deliver pressure from the foot valve and what we need to watch back here is our service chamber gauge. Now I've delivered about 30 pounds of pressure and if you can see back there on that gauge we've only got a slight bit of pressure, correct? Give it about 60 pounds we've only got a little bit more, not much not much in that. What I have done here, the brake proportioning valve has dropped the pressure going to that relay valve by 75 percent taking the overkill off of that rear axle. Now if you're watching, you notice there was another black line. Follow that black line here. And that was our limiting quick release valve, which we will now call our BP1 front axle valve. The best way to see what happens up here is to uh, make another application. Remember before, we made an application here. If I delivered 30 to it, it would only deliver half of that to the chambers. So in this case, I'll deliver 30. And if you look at that gauge on the front axle, it is also delivering 30 to the front axle brakes. 60. It delivers 60 to the front axle brakes. So air pressure on the front BP1 actually shuts the valve off, and any pressure that enters it, that exact same amount will be delivered. So this valve at this point, in this mode, isn't doing anything whatsoever. So we have full pressure on the front axle and we've limited that rear axle pressure by about 75%. The driver gets the feeling that he is actually hauling a trailer when he touches his brakes.
The final system is the um, trailer system itself. Uh, the best way to describe the trailer system would be to describe the um, old trailer system. Old meaning pre-1975, pre-121. In fact, we'll go way back here, back to the 60s. And what we had was a valve called a relay emergency valve, RE6, RE4 valve. We also had one tank. And if we go way back, as I say, we didn't have spring brakes. We just had service chambers. Now, this was a fairly simple system. It had an emergency line, which we now call the supply line. And it also had the service line. It came from the foot valve. It got its supply of air from the tank. And it delivered the pressure to those service chambers. So when you applied the foot pedal, you sent air in the service chamber, or rather in the service line, it activated the relay portion of the relay emergency valve, applying the chambers, applying the brakes on the trailer axle. What was different about this system as opposed to our new system is in the emergency portion. When this pressure dropped, whether you disconnected the hose or pulled the red or yellow button out, the emergency portion would notice a drop of pressure, would take this remaining pressure and deliver it to the service chambers. In essence, you were parked on air. Now overnight, the air would bleed off, there were no spring brakes, and you were parked on your landing gear, or you were parked just on your tractor brake. They came out with spring brakes. They added the spring brakes to our system here. And then all they did was pipe the spring brake into the tank. Everything else remained the same. So when you lost that pressure on the emergency line by pulling the red button out, you still did not park on springs. What you were parking on was that same air pressure. When that air pressure bled off, then the spring would apply. If you wanted to park on springs, you'd have to park the tractor, get out of it, crawl underneath the trailer, empty the tank out. And that's how you'd park on springs. The new system is uh, a bit more complicated. However, it is a much more efficient and much better system than the old, and also a much safer system. We have uh, two tanks. Sometimes we'll have three. And we have two valves. You may sometimes see three valves. This is about as simple as the uh, new system will get. Two tanks, two valves. The key to this system is in this valve right here. And this is an SR4 spring brake valve. This is connected to our trailer charge system. When the red button is in and pressure is sent from the tractor, this valve here fills both tanks with pressure and also fills our spring brakes with pressure. Now, if we decide to park the trailer or the whole system, we pull one of the buttons out, we get what's called a demonstrated park. You heard the air come out. Our spring brakes are now applied. But on the gauges, we still have full system pressure. Now, the old system, we'd have to drain the tank out to park on springs. Now we just pull the red button out. You could actually disconnect the lines, get another tractor, hook it up, and you've got full system pressure. Then all we have to do is push our red or yellow button back in. Our spring brakes come off. We use just a little bit of pressure, and away we go. This SR4 valve also protects one tank from another. Now, try to think of this for a second. Um, you're on a railroad track, and there's a train coming, and you don't have any air pressure. Uh, how do you get off the track? Well, you get out of the truck, you get to those spring brakes with your wrench, and you draw the bolt out caging the spring so you can move. Kind of tough to do when you've got a freight train coming at you. In our new system on our tractor, we no longer have a spring brake tank. As we've already seen, we've got a front and rear axle tank that feed a double check. So if we lose one of these tanks, we will still have our spring brakes compressed and we can still move.
We've got two tanks here and we have that system built into this SR4 trailer system. What we can do here is we can pull up on the railroad track and park the trailer. It doesn't make any difference which tank we lose as long as we still have the other one. I'm going to dump the top tank or the uh, trailer service tank number one. Now, due to the pressure protection valves in this system here, this has gone down to zero because we've emptied the tank out. This has dropped to 60, didn't go any lower. What we do now, where our spring brakes are applied, we push our red button in and we watch the push rods on our trailer system. Red button goes in, and air enters the spring brakes of the trailer system. It wouldn't make any difference which tank I lost. The remaining tank would serve as the spring brake backup tank. And finally on the trailer system, one last thing. Remember the anti-compounding on our tractor. We could have that same situation back here on the trailer. It would work exactly the opposite of the tractor. We pull a tractor trailer unit in. We have our foot on the foot pedal and we pull a yellow button out. What we have done in that case is trapped air in the service line of the trailer. Our spring brakes are applied and there's air trapped in the service line of the trailer applying the service brakes. Very simply, what we have built into the SR4 is another shuttle system. In the case of parking the tractor with air trapped in the service line, air would enter through an empty line and out the open exhaust of our SR4 releasing the air, releasing the pressure off the service chambers so that now we are only parked on the springs and not on the service side. Thus, we have our anti-compounding. If you need more information on the Bendix air brake system, there are some uh, literature that you can get from your local Bendix distributor.